Hello everyone, this is Evan Abrams, and in this video, we're gonna talk about an important part of the pre-production process, it's writing for motion design. Now, even if your piece doesn't even have voiceover or dialogue, you still need to write down what we're expected to see. What are the narrative arcs? What are the beats you're planning to go through? Maybe it's a short piece or a long piece. You should still be writing down your ideas. Writing is a very quick way to iterate through a bunch of ideas before you have to try them out visually. It's also important to organize your thoughts so that you can collect them and start to filter out bad ideas, keep good ideas, expand on areas, shrink areas. Writing can really help refine what you're about to create. And while many of us motion designers get scripts foisted on us, it's important to take those scripts and turn them into meaningful visual things. It's all well and good to have an amazing style, but if there's no substance to a piece, what are we really doing here? So in this video, we're gonna look at a couple of scenarios. One where you have total control and can create the script however you like. And the second will be what to do when some other department has brought a script together and they're just giving it to you. Both of these are gonna make use of creating something called an AV script. And to do it, we're gonna be using a program called Milanote. So please join us as we get into an important phase of pre-production. It's writing for motion design. This series is brought to you by Milanote. Milanote is a wonderful new web app that allows you to organize images, text, and clippings to get your creative ideas all put out there and organized together in a cohesive way. A lot of creative projects start very messy and nebulous, and Milanote can really help to get things organized, get them structured, and get you being more productive in your process. So I've got Milanote open here, and we're gonna explore some examples. Let's talk about formatting. If we were to write something for television or film, we might use some traditional script examples. For example, this is a shooting draft from 30 Rock. When you look at a teleplay like this, we have some transition direction, talking about fading in. We have a scene and a scene number. It's saying who's in there. It's got a description of action. And you'll notice it's very specific in the description. Jack and Liz are there. This is on Jack's computer. That's the only important thing. We don't describe the potted plants on the desk or what's in the background, what's happening at the window. If it's not important, it's not there. Front and center, in the middle of this thing, we have the formatting of dialogue. And most of the pages are taken up with dialogue. Similarly, here's a page from Up. Again, we have descriptions, we have voiceovers, we have voiceovers that are happening off screen, we're describing scenes, things inside the scenes, but again, it's the same teleplay format. And both of these are focused on audio, what's being heard, and to parse out what's happening at the same time is a little bit difficult. When working with motion design, we tend to borrow more heavily from the commercial script. Here's an example I go to all the time. This has the audio of Lou Gehrig, famous baseball player, diagnosed with a terrible disease, and he gave a wonderful speech. So we plug that audio in over here, and then we write in some video to match it. This is what we would have to do if the audio was provided and unchangeable. And this is the third column. This is where you leave yourself notes about what the purpose of this scene is or why it's happening. When you present this, you can remove the notes column. It won't be useful. But this column is super important and we'll get to its functions later in using your AV script as a tool in pre-production. So what would we do if we could write the whole thing, if we had full control over every aspect, maybe this is a short film, this is a narrative piece. We've been working through this project based around dramatizing a chess game. So far, we have created a wonderful mood board that's getting a lot of compelling ideas. Ooh, what's gonna be happening? What kind of colors are we using? How are we feeling? And we have a creative brief that tells us technical deliverables, the purpose of this piece, and some kind of direction or directive. All of this is gonna help us create our script. I ended up with a visual script that looks like this. Another strange way of formatting things. So, where do we start? How do we make this stuff happen? Well, here's an example of how we might begin. Now granted, we're using Milanote here, and I love Milanote for its ability to push these virtual cards around. Traditionally, we would have had to do this with actual note cards, and we just start writing things on them. We're doing it this way rather than jumping into a table because it's so easy to just grab and drag, move things around, switch them out. Being flexible in this way and not working linearly is very helpful to this process. Here in this example, where we're starting fresh, we have nothing written down. We have video, audio, 
and conceptual, what we wanna do is start with a framework. We wanna start with a skeleton and then putting things on it. We wanna start with broad strokes and then start defining. So perhaps for your piece, you're gonna do a little short story. We're gonna have some exposition, some rising action, a climax, some falling action, and some resolution. And if you've been inspired to create something, some kind of wonderful motion design piece, you might already have some visual ideas for these. What's happening at the climax? What is this the exciting turning moment, the change? What is gonna happen? What does that look like? You can start in the middle. You can go ahead and, and start in there if you'd like, or you can start at the resolution. You already know how it's gonna end. What is it gonna end with? Well, it's gonna end, in our case, that this should be a loop. We should see player A do a thing, think critically about their next move, make their move, and then the board flips over and it's player B's turn to be in the hot seat. So we might say player B makes their move and player A is pressurized. So that might be the resolution of this piece. But what are we what are we supposed to be putting here in the audio zone? If your piece doesn't have voiceover, this might be empty. And quite frankly, during this phase, we have to decide, are we gonna lean on audio? Are we gonna lean more on video? Are the two gonna play off of each other? In an ideal world, both are stellar. Both of them build on each other. One doesn't lead and the other one lag. Sometimes you'll have pieces of audio that have to be in there. If this were a more commercial piece, our conceptual column might be problem, solution, call to action. The call to action might be some very specific verbiage, some branded taglines that have to be there. If this is gonna be say for television, then you definitely need to have strong audio. Has to be very compelling, has to stop people from tweeting and looking at their phones. If this is gonna be delivered on Facebook or Twitter, then the video component is way more important. People probably aren't even gonna hear anything. Their sound is off or they have to enable sound because it's off by default. So the video component has to be the strongest. So you can either have a visually dominated piece, a visually driven piece or an audio driven piece. And I recommend you have a conceptually driven piece such that the strongest elements allow you to tie this all together. So what do we actually write in here when we're thinking about what we are writing when we write for motion design? Let's explain what the exposition is. A chess game is starting. Maybe that's the exposition part of this. That explains to the audience what is happening. And then some rising action. Player A will make an opening decisive move. Ooh. Or maybe that's more exposition because that's introducing the situation. The chess game is starting, someone makes a decisive first move, and now it's time for player B to panic. And that is gonna be the rising action as we go through the tension happening in player B's mind. So then the climax might be that player B chooses the right move. We're exploring their thought process through the rising action, then player B chooses the right move, they make the move and then we switch it back and then the GIF can loop if that's what we're doing. We have written a lot of ambiguous ideas in the video area. The most ambiguous I think here is player B panics. What does that look like? What does panic look like on this character's face? What are we even showing to convey panic? What's important with writing here is we wanna write what we are showing. We would take this card, maybe we flip it over and we might write something else on it. So player B panics, so that could be sweat forms on their head, that could be narrowing eyes, uh, gritting teeth. That could be that kind of lip biting kind of thing. These are all the things that we would do to show what is happening. We could take a whole other tack though in showing panic. We could show POV from the character's perspective as their hand hovers from one piece to another. That's showing that panic, that indecision. We're showing it in a different way. So you wanna go through and you might end up with a bunch of cards that communicate the same thing. And then you'll choose one. But you wanna save all of these ideas because you might get further down the trail and think, oh, you know what? Ah, oh, that last idea, that was so good. I'm gonna go back to that. I'm gonna explore that one. Let's go down that path. And we're putting ideas out here quickly. How can we make this appear like a decisive move? That shows, oh, I'm decisive. Slam down the piece, slap the clock. That tells me this person is decisive. We could even get more specific about what piece is being moved. When we start to think about how we're gonna storyboard this, we're gonna read this script, and then we're gonna draw what that looks like. Again, we're gonna be choosing angles and framing and what's in there. 
If there's something that is important that needs to be in frame, you want to describe it here in this video area. It's not enough to say a game of chess is starting because that could mean something to anybody. What's in the scene? What's important that we see? If it's not important, consider removing it. There's this great phrase, if you have a good two minutes, you probably have a great one minute. When you're writing your script, you're starting to decide how long this thing is gonna be. You might even have a target time. We have to show this all in a minute. So you have to start paring things down, removing things, deciding what belongs, what doesn't belong. Can we convey this exposition in one image, in one idea that gets us there right away. Does this need to be a little bit longer? Do we need to sit on this longer? We can decide that here in the script phase before we get to anything, before we have to animate anything. But honestly, sometimes we don't have that freedom. Let's go to the other way we interact with the script. Someone drops audio on us and we have to come up with video that goes with it. This is a very common scenario that happens all the time. A marketing department comes to you with something, a comms department, some writer has already crafted this story, it's approved, this is what we're going with. And now you, the motion designer, need to design some motion that goes with that audio. So you might end up with a lot of corporate speak, you might end up with a lot of uh, synergizing the upflows of et cetera, et cetera, or it might be a lot of technical jargon. So in those cases, it's very difficult to come up with video concepts that go with that. Not all words translate to video as well. It's part of the challenge to come up with video that goes with it, but we have to recognize that some audio is just filler. If the audio is filler, the video is filler. Take out the filler. If you have 13 words, but you can say it in five, use fewer words. That's my spiel on specifically what you should put in your audio. Less is what you should always put in your audio. But sometimes, like I said, you can't change it. There's nothing to be done. It is what it is. Especially in a case where you're animating to a pre-recorded or historical document, such as the Luckiest Man speech by Lou Gehrig. It's a very compelling speech and he's a very terse person, so he doesn't use more words than he has to. When you're presented with the audio, you wanna break it down into blocks. This is where we are using a table here in the Google Docs. So we first break the audio into blocks. I've got it chunkified into all of its discrete sentences. If you have a very long sentence, you might need to chunkify it even more. And you might need to break these things up. If there's a paragraph break, you'd probably wanna put a transition in between it. As you're going from one idea to another, you wanna make sure you give yourself the space to transition from one idea to another visually at the same time. This is where I like to talk about the idea of literalization, making things literally what they're saying, or abstraction, where we're making things a representation of the themes present. So here is one approach we might take with the video. Fans, for the past two weeks, you've been reading about a bad break I got, Yet today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. How would we animate that? Well, one approach, very literally, could be to have a newspaper unfold, headline of the diagnosis, and then a large photo of Lou standing on the baseball diamond. That is literally what's being described here. Someone reading about a bad break this guy got. Or maybe it's a photo of Lou in the hospital. But this idea of literally showing what the audio is saying. When someone is describing an app, we show a phone with a facsimile of the interface and a finger pokes the app. Happens all the time. And it's totally valid to do this. But we could instead do something much more abstract. We could say for the past two weeks, you've been reading about a bad break I got, and we could be showing inside of Lou's brain, we could be showing ALS taking a hold of his body. We could, instead of showing the newspaper, we could just show Lou in a hospital bed. We could show a fan responding with a tear coming down and smudging their face paint. You may need to try many times before you arrive at the ideal video. You could have to have a combination of literal and abstract things. You might decide halfway through, oh, I need to go back to this idea because these don't flow into each other. These two thoughts, we wrote them down so they do flow. We could start with this photo of Lou on the baseball diamond, and then as he talks about being the luckiest man on the face of the earth, we push into the photo, goes from black and white into color, and now we're in the real space of Lou giving that speech on the ball diamond. We could do that. And then we have the camera orbit around the Lou character, and then we can go zoom into the crowd and all that stuff. But we want to be planning out. The script is not just direction and description, it is planning. Pre-production is planning. This is a tool, this is a document that we use to estimate, 
to plan to understand our production. You should be able to have an understanding of how difficult it will be to do these things. How hard will it be to create a three-dimensional Lou character and have the camera orbit around them? Is orbiting around Lou super important? So maybe we can use a simpler concept here to save us the trouble. As we read this stuff, we think about what kind of assets we need to create. How are we actually going to achieve this? At the same time, we should be considering those style frames. We're gonna choose blocks out of here to create our style frame, or we're just gonna look at the mood board and create our style frame based on that. So this kind of happens in conjunction with the style frame, and we have to consider how are we actually going to show these in the style that we are choosing? Is that gonna be difficult? Is it gonna be easy? Is it too complex? What is the actual cost of this in terms of hours and then in terms of money? So the AV script becomes a tool not only for communicating what we're gonna do, but how we're gonna quote this thing. By looking at the video portion of an AV script, you should have a very clear idea of how challenging this is going to be. And that is why pre-production is so important. This is our map. We can tell, oh man, we're gonna have to drive over this mountain. We're gonna have to portage over this river. Or we'll say, oh, it's gonna be a nice leisurely drive through the countryside. The map tells us, and we are choosing our route. How do we arrive at the emotional impact we want with the resources we have on hand? So all of that is the purpose for writing for motion design. So in our chess project, we ended up with this eventual visual script that we then had to change to be this shot list so that I can understand exactly what does it look like when a game of chess is beginning? What does it look like when player A starts the clock? What angles, what shots, what's in the scene, what isn't there? What are we actually doing? So the purpose of writing down these ideas isn't just to communicate with a team or with producers or with somebody along the value chain. It's also to communicate with yourself. You might only be writing a script because you need notes on what the narrative beats are or what the scenes are gonna be about. At this stage, when everything's just words, we can decide to go bigger or smaller with scenes. We can get more complex or we can simplify. We haven't committed to any one direction yet. We can also use these scripts to estimate costs, estimate time, figure out if we need to bring in other people to deal with the high concept ideas that we've put together. And granted, all of this will get more refined as we work through style frames and storyboards, having a compelling narrative already in place. If something works on paper before you've drawn anything, you have an amazing head start on creating compelling motion design. And even if you don't write a lot of scripts in your process, hopefully this will allow you to maybe advise other people in the production pipeline with how they can be delivering scripts that are a lot easier to animate or more agreeable towards motion design. If you have questions about any of this kind of thing, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to help you out. And if you want to work through your script process using the same software we did, please enjoy our sponsor, Milanote. They make a wonderful web application that I enjoy for my pre-production process. Please use the link in description to enjoy a free trial of that. And this is a whole series on pre-production. We've gone from mood boards, and now we're going on through writing. We're going to have some style frames. We're going to have animatics. It's going to be amazing. I'm very proud of what we've made here, and hopefully it gets people making even better motion design. I'm Evan Abrams. If you enjoy watching this kind of thing, please subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications so you know when new things come up. And if you do that, I'll see you around the internet. Thanks again and have a great day.